All right, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for being here and being so enthusiastic. Oh my goodness, it's happy to be with you all. Um, uh, my name is Daryl Young. I'm here at Harvey Mudd in the math department. And um, I have a couple disclaimers and then we'll get things going. Okay. So first of all, I'm noticing the furniture is, is arranged in a really unfriendly way for group work. And we're actually going to do group work together. <laughs> so I, at some point, I might have to rearrange a little bit, but we'll be flexible about that, I'm sure. Um, so don't be shy and uh, be willing to jump in when we get to that point. I will also want to tell you that this is not really a class that has anything to do with flipped classrooms, really, because um, the premise of this session is that you've already flipped your class and now you want to do something interesting in your class, maybe involving groups of students together. And so the question is, how might we structure those group opportunities to really make them have the biggest impact possible? Okay. So probably after this point forward, I'm not going to talk about flipped classrooms anymore. Really. So sorry if you thought this was about flipping. It's not really about flipping. Um, the, the third thing I want to warn you about is that there is a huge literature on teamwork and group work, spanning from educational psychology all the way to like management consultancy literature because you know companies are really interested in making teams of people work really well and producing product and so there's a lot of writing and a lot of different things that are said there's no way that i can know everything and i don't know everything and in fact the stuff that i do know is going to be biased towards the math education literature so i'm just going to apologize in advance but I also know that within this room, there's a huge amount of wisdom and experience. And so I hope to draw from you also and that we can share from each other. Um, the fourth thing is that the talk title says practical strategies for implementing group work. And now I'm focusing on the word practical here. The word practical is there because we're focusing on practice, classroom practice. But this talk is also not like 79 ways to make your groups more exciting. So I, I think that that kind of thing is great but you can also find those things on the internet really easily. So I'm not here to give you like a laundry list of things. What I am going to try to do is to balance a bit of um, experience and practical advice, but also giving some framing questions and some tools that you can use that maybe will help you decide which of those 79 things really is the one to use. Because the one thing that I heard a lot in yesterday's um, closing dinner was this notion that there are lots of different paths to take to get to uh, a wonderful outcome in your class. And I really value that kind of openness and, and um, just, you know, willingness to try different things. But I also want to say that I think uh, um, in your particular circumstance, in your, in your classroom with your students, there is probably a few different options that will be the optimal ones. So it's not like any one of those will work and it doesn't matter which one I choose. The answer actually is, yeah, those are all available and maybe some of those work for her, some of those work for me, but for my particular circumstance, there should be optimal choices. And so how do we find those optimal choices for us? So we need a way of thinking about group work so that we can find those things for ourselves, okay? So all of that to say that we're here to talk about group work. And the main question we're trying to address today is how do we do it effectively and in a sustainable way for ourselves? Because we all are busy people too and we want to not kill ourselves by doing everything under the sun, okay? Um, one of the reasons why I think group work can be effective but at the same time can be really tricky is because um, of our students and their feelings about group work, which are very complicated. So I'll show you something I saw on Reddit recently This is a very common feeling, do you not agree? Students, generally speaking, they, I don't know, they fall into some, sort of like a, yeah, I'm, well, I'm okay with it, oh, I'm meh, or like, oh my gosh, I hate, don't put me in a group. Um, and also, I'm thinking a lot about what Sarah, Smith, uh, Sarah Clifton said to us yesterday about, about introverts too. So not that they don't trust anyone, but that they're just really different attitudes towards the way that I want to interact with other people, especially when I'm learning. Okay, so 
to outline, I'm going to um, show you maybe just generally what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start with the question of what do we mean by group work? Okay. Then we'll jump to why we use group work. What are the reasons and benefits for using group work in our classes? Um, what are some key concepts that relate to group work that will help us to make the choices that we need to make? Um, what are some practical implementation things? And then if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll do some troubleshooting in a group about like how do we handle these common, like greedy, awful things. All right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Is that your cell phone you're using to advance your PowerPoint? Yeah. Slides? Yeah, I found. Holy shit. I mean, holy, holy. <laughs> <laughs> Share a lot of that. Thanks, sure, sure. This is super easy. I just discovered this too. So if you use PowerPoint, um, there's an app called Office Remote. Um, it works on any phone, like iPhone or your tablet or your Android or whatever. And I basically have my notes on my slides, wow. and then I just swipe, swipe through my slides here. Wow. I know it's really sneaky. Yeah. You just made my day. Hey, great. I'm glad you like that. <laughs> Thank you. And you know what, Fred, one more thing that you did for me that I forgot to say is that please, like, please just interrupt me at any point. Like, I want this to be interactive. And so thank you. I really, really, really appreciate that. OK. <laughs> awesome. OK, so you guys ready to dive in? So we're going to jump into that first question. And so we all have a common understanding of what we mean when we say group work. And, and when, I, uh, when we start this question, I'm going to kind of ask a weird question and zoom out a bit. I'm going to ask the question, what is teaching? Which seems like this like, bizarre question to say at a flip conference. But I'm, I'm using this diagram from a paper by Cohen, Roudenbush, and Ball, which I found really helpful because it gives me a schematic for what teaching could look like. And so in their model for teaching, they place instructors, students, and content as the three primary actors. And then they have these arrows connecting the, the different players. And those arrows and the placement of this whole schematic is what constitutes teaching. So the design of teaching, the implementation of teaching, is the design of the interaction between instructors and students, between students and, them, and other students, between students and the content, and, and between you and the content, too. Okay. That, all of that happens in the context of the space, which we call the classroom. So that happens within this oval called the classroom environment here. And that classroom environment lives within the environment of the school. And there's a context in which you, you operate. right? And there, there's a society around that, too. So there's this ever-widening circles of context. So everything that we do is very contextual. And yet, what we have to do is to attend to these arrows in the context of all of those things. Okay? Um, one thing I want to point out here, I will come back to later, is that I like this diagram because it helps me to, me to remember that um, the arrow between instructor and students represents kinds of interactions that are asymmetric. My interactions with my students are different from the interactions that they have with me, because usually the information is going more one way than the other way. Okay? Whereas the arrows between the students, that's a symmetric one. These are usually happening in more symmetric ways. Okay? Now, um, the focus for us today will be in this little section. Oh, and oh, Fred's reminding me of another thing. Um, I'm posting the slides later, so if you happen to not want to take notes, just you can <coughs> just rest easy. Okay. Um, our focus is this little red section right here in which we're really trying today to ask the question of how we structure these arrows here. Primarily these, but notice, notice I also captured part of that arrow because I'm, I'm gonna, as the instructor, going to have to situate that work somehow and, in, and formulate how this works. And of course, the students are also interacting with content. Okay? But when we talk about group work today, I'm generally talking about within the classroom interactions of students with other students in some formal way that I decide as an instructor. Okay? Now, those can take on a huge different range of forms. Uh, yesterday, we heard the word think, pair, share a whole lot. Um, uh, what about the term jigsaw? Is that a term that's familiar to people? OK, so for, for uh, someone who is familiar with the word jigsaw, would you be willing to um, maybe give a definition for those who may not be familiar with that word? Anyone? Oh, go ahead. Uh, sir, in the back, do you mind trying? I, I, I'm not oh, I'm so sorry. I thought you raised your hand. OK. Um, so commonly played by older people. 
<laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, do you mind? Go ahead. I think of it like more like this, like you have these overlapping groups, you have these kind of groups, and then you have these kind of groups. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So that's that's um, uh, the jigsaw, but there's think, pair, share. There's all kinds of arrangements that you can do in your classroom. You can have a group project, and then you have them present, as we heard today. So there's all, so a myriad of different ways to organize what we're calling group work. Um, I should also warn you that if you like digging into literature uh, about teaching and learning, if you want to find things on group work, be aware that the search terms vary greatly depending on your field. So the word that we use as practitioners, group work, is actually not generally the word that people use. People usually describe it as small group instruction or small group instructional methodology. Or you might also hear people talk about cooperative learning or collaborative learning. Okay, so there are a variety of different words just to be, for you to be aware of. And those words also sometimes vary in their meaning, so just to be aware. Okay. Um, so, yeah, yeah, please. This content is done between the instructors and the students. It's something separate that the students and instructors are all responsible for uh, learning. Like in, in my section, someone said, what if you don't, if you're flipping your class and you're giving a mini lesson or you don't you don't cover something there's content just that's one uh, 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 negative that the mm -hmm. professors say I'm not going to flip because mm -hmm. there's too much content to cover and I mm -hmm. have to cover it all mm -hmm. and, 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 and there that schematic says hey the students are directly connected to and responsible for learning the content more and more so it's a great schematic Thank you. I take no credit for it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. All right. So um, now let's dive into the question of why. Why do we use group work? Okay. So what are the positive benefits of group work, either for our students or for ourselves? Okay. That you think are that you think exist. Um, so I would like to pause now. I'm going to give you. Two minutes, 120 seconds. You're going to brainstorm on your own, silently, please, on as many different reasons as you can for why group work is a potential positive thing. Okay? So go ahead. I'm going to start the clock now. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> you were just enthusiastic about it.
about, uh, let's see, 10 more seconds. Okay, here's what we're going to do next. I'm going to randomize you. So I'm going to call out a number from 1 to 9. You're going to meet with the other people with the same number. Okay, ready? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Now, Bert. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And Nancy, you can join if you're really joining. Okay? So here's your job. Your task is the following. You're going to get up You're going to get up to see the other people with the same number. First you're going to consolidate your list. Share your list and consolidate with each other. Maybe they're repeats, maybe they're new ideas, maybe there's clarification. And then your job is to go up to the board, use the whiteboard markers and make a list of all the ones that are really compelling to you. As many as you want, okay? Maybe maybe not more than like 10. That's a lot. Okay? Ready? Go. <laughs> So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Monica, eight is here. Eight, you're good. Are you a nine? I'm an eight. Oh, you're an eight. Sweet. Nine is over there. Nine. Eight's awesome. Okay. Nine. Okay. I'll move this back a bit so you can have more space. Are you missing a seven? Yes. I think maybe someone might be confused, so... Well, for a change, for a change it's not me, so... <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's okay. Do you mind being a two some? Okay.
60 more seconds, 60 seconds. Okay, time's up. All right, thanks everyone for being so willing to just jump in and try it. This is so amazing. I love what you guys have written on the board. Uh, let's do a little gallery walk. So the furniture is really tight here. So how about we'll circulate in a, a what is this, counterclockwise manner? All right, so just walk around and make note of ones that seem interesting to you or if you have questions you wanna ask later, Make a note of which one you want to ask about, okay? You could, or just remember, yeah, make a note to yourself.
they asked you to make that work. Oh my God. Yeah, my comp my phone is over there. I'm la I'm la <laughs> Okay, 30 more seconds. So I'm glad that you came, Andrea. Yeah, it's been good for me so far. Oh, good. I'm so glad to hear that. A little teaching experience. It's good to pick up new stuff. Of course. I was crazy. And this was one of the first flipped workshops that I've been to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we seem to have like a little log jam. Okay, thanks everyone. If you could find your seats, please. I have a clipboard that someone left on the desk. Okay. All right, uh, does anyone want to ask a question like, oh, group number six, could you clarify what you meant by, or could you elaborate on what you, yeah, Nancy? Yeah, okay. Did you hear the question? Group eight. Yeah. Someone was really interested about what you were talking about, group improv creativity. Could you say more about that? Yeah, it's sort of, it came first when I addressed my age here. So it, it came out of, um, actually, we were sort of doing exactly that. We, were, we each had a, a thought that we couldn't really crystallize and just a little blurb, and that just sort of popped out of my head. <laughs> so. But yeah, it's sort of kind of putting you on the spot, and okay, you got to, you know, two minutes or something like that to talk about this problem or 
whatever it is you're working on. And mm. So it's it's like thinking on the spot and just say whatever comes to mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think we were also discussing the, the fact that being synergistic in a group has benefits and you actually have to learn to be synergistic and there's a lot of benefits that are hard to capture unless you're actually participating in it. Mm -hmm. So I was surprised by the commonality among the groups. Yeah. It seems like Interesting. a lot of the same points. Uh -huh. And I was wondering out loud whether that was because we've all been socialized <laughs> students are saying that uh, can, you can modify in your, your teaching based on what you hear going on mm. in the groups. Mm. If they're struggling with a concept or misunderstanding concept, then you, imme you can immediately change your, what you're going to teach. Okay. Not a question, but a comment. Go for it. <clears throat> By the way, I'm making a little parking lot of questions and issues that we want to just leave because we may not resolve everything. Actually, you know what? We will not resolve everything for sure. But these are just things that remind us that we can talk about them more. Stephanie? Just add one more note. I think it is more challenging to do with larger groups of students. Um, in our department at Harvey Mudd, we constantly have this ar argument about what's the ideal class size in our courses. And some of us feel like, well, it's just so much work if I have, you know, 25 students. And I'm thinking like, oh my God, <laughs> you just don't know what other people go through. Um, and so I think maybe it's an argument for our, collab our, our colleagues and our, our administrators. Like, if you have a compelling reason for why your class should be a certain size, then you can argue for it, but you have to have a compelling reason. And perhaps group work is that compelling reason. If you're lecturing and you have graders, I don't really think there's a reason why your class size can't be 100 or 500 or whatever. That's just my personal opinion. And I will sell my workshop during D. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you for doing that. Um, to share with you my personal list, I tried to anticipate as many of yours as I could. And I think you'll see, I think I did that. I know this is really small. You can get it later. But just take a look and scan and see if there are any things that resonate with you.
um, I should say, group work isn't the only way to do active learning. There's plenty of active learning you can do where it's just a, a student by her or his own self in the room. That is totally fine. But group work is one way to do it. Okay? Um, so these are just some of our reasons, maybe, that we collected together. What does the literature say? I, I pulled one good quote out from a person I really, really respect, Elizabeth Cohn from Stanford University. Cooperative learning has gained increasing acceptance in classrooms as a strategy for producing learning gains. The development of higher order thinking, pro-social behavior, interracial acceptance and as a way to manage het academic heterogeneity <coughs> in classrooms with a wide range of achievement in basic Theoretically, small groups offer special opportunities for active learning and substantive conversation that are essential for authentic achievement, a goal recommended in the current drive to restructure schools. Small groups have already been widely recommended as a means to achieve equity. Okay. So I share that with you as sort of a foreshadowing of the thing I'm about to do in about one more minute. Um, but I'll just round off this section about talking about purposes with I think what is probably the main point of the whole presentation today. Okay, so here it is. Ready? As with other instructional choices we make, the decision to use group work must be purposeful. The design, structure, and parameters of the group work should align with those purposes. That's in it in a nutshell. There are lots of reasons to do group work. <clears throat> You're not going to do all 15 or 20 of them at one time. You have maybe two or three that you really want to uh, uh, emphasize in any particular setting, in any situation. The parameters of the group work should match those objectives, whatever you decide to do. And the decisions that we make all the time, whether they be large or be small, like large as in, you know, maybe what am I going to have them do in the groups or um, what. Uh, what product or uh, how, what structure of group am I going to use? Those are maybe bigger decisions down to micro decisions like how many in a group, how many copies of handouts do I make? Like all of those little micro decisions also can be an intentional uh, choice that you make to support whatever objective you have decided for the activity. Okay? So I think what the rest of the time is today is really unpacking this issue. So yes, we all understand this sort of common sense. Why would it be any other way than this? But then the issue is how do you really tie, tie very con tightly connected your objective with the constraints and the parameter choices that you've made for your group work? Okay. So to do that, I have three key concepts that I would like us to consider as we make these decisions. I will try to go through them quickly. I'm going to talk at you for a little while, so I apologize. Okay. Um, the first of these ideas is um, something that comes to us from psychology. So I'm going to share with you this, this um, thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately. Um, is anyone familiar with the psycho psychological theory, Maslow's hierarchy of needs? This was created by Abraham Maslow in um, the 1940s as a theory to explain why people do the things they do. Why do I go and marry this person as opposed to that person, or why do I blah, blah, blah. So it doesn't have to do with teaching and learning, but recently I've been thinking a lot about how this actually is so much about what happens in my classroom, because all of our students are humans and they need things, right? So in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, he divides human needs into five categories and he places them in this triangular thing to illustrate some needs are sort of more base and fundamental than others. So the ones that are at the bottom are the ones that are the most urgent in the sense. Physiological, like I have to be able to breathe. I need food and water and shelter. Um, those sorts of issues. Safety, like I don't want to be hit by a car. You know, um, I want to love someone and feel loved by other people. So these are issues that we deal with in our lives. And according to his theory, if you don't have one of the needs met at a certain level, you don't perceive the needs above it. So if I cannot breathe right now, that is my top priority. I'm going to do everything I can to breathe first, and then I will worry about being safe later. If I'm not even safe right now, like if I don't know if I can um, cross the street safely, I'm not going to worry right now that um, you know I have a date tonight or whatever it is like that. Okay. 
So I think what is interesting is if we sort of take each of these things and just map them directly onto actual classroom experiences and things. Okay, so I'm going to do that next. I'll start with phys physiological. Um, I'm kind of keep it quickly because like our students can breathe and they have food and shelter. Except you know some of our students are not food secure, and at Harvey Mudd, um, they don't sleep. I don't know if your kids are like that too. When they have not slept. It's really hard to expect them to be able to have concerns of other things, like doing well in the class. Um, so after you get past that, safety. Okay. Instead of physical safety, and I should say, I'm, I'm just mm, this is something that's stuck in my craw, my, my foot, like it's just bothering me a lot. Physical safety is not what we're talking about here, but we should all recognize that. Um, sexual violence is a huge issue on our college campuses, and for many students, their actual physical safety is on their minds. How can you possibly concentrate in class if you are worried about something that just happened to you last night? So I'll just leave that there. That's something that you probably don't have a lot of control personally over for your students, but just gives you maybe a sense of compassion and understanding. So the kind of safety I'm talking about here is um, what I'm going to describe as either emotional or intellectual safety. Emotional safety in the classroom is the safety that students have that I am not going to be ridiculed by my peers or by my instructor for the way I look or for anything about me as a person. Intellectual safety is sort of attached to that, and it has to do with my safety, my feeling of safety to be able to take an intellectual risk in class. And this is especially important for group work because when I am talking with another student, I am likely to let on how much I know about the particular topic, and that could be really scary for some students. Let me just share a quote from you. These are my Harvey Mudd College students who were in my partial differential equations class last semester. Um, these are juniors and seniors, so these are not like beginning students. Okay? One student wrote to me on a feedback form, right now I'm insecure enough about solving problems that the pressure of group work makes me shut down, which only makes it worse. That really bummed me out when I read that. It really did. And it just reminded me like, oh my gosh, I haven't attended to the fact that it's OK for people to not be at the same place and for some people to know more than others. Like Even that can be really scary for some students. So you have to find ways to build that into your class if you want to do group work. Okay? And I'll go, we'll talk about some maybe practical strategies for that. Love and belong. Yeah, please. Mm, thank you for adding that. I hadn't thought of that. Cool. I'm gonna. Can I steal that? Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Um, love and belonging. Okay, I'm gonna say love because that's a little um, taboo. <laughs> that's cool. But I'm gonna focus on belonging. <clears throat> belonging. I'm gonna break out into three categories. I'm gonna describe that as belonging to the group. So within the group of students, like group of four or whatever, I have to feel like I belong in that group. Okay. Um, but then there's also belongingness to the classroom. So all of us in the room are a community together. Do I feel like I belong in this space? Do I have a right to be here? And then there's a belongingness to a community of practitioners. So for me, this is a really big issue, especially in my upper division classes, because in those classes, now we're getting to the point where we're, we're doing really authentic industry or you know, professional level things. And so I want my students to envision themselves as being part of that community of practitioners. Can they see themselves as being a mathematician? Can they see themselves as being an engineer? I would like that to happen. Okay, so love and belonging, skip the love, but maybe think belonging. Okay? Belonging to, to different contexts. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So on the love piece, and I don't remember the <coughs> jargonized terminology for this, but there, there's an element where if the students don't feel that you kind of like them and have their best interest in mm -hmm. heart. Side. 
Fred, go ahead. Uh, I, this relates to the love and the safety issue. Mm. If I can, can recommend mm -hmm. a resource. Please. It's a four-minute YouTube video. Oh, okay. That you must watch. All right. The uh, YouTube author is called Mathema Mathematical. Mathematical. Yeah, okay. M a t h e m a t i g a l. Okay. Mathematical. And the video is entitled, A Math Major Talks About Fear. Ooh, okay. It's four minutes of just awesome. She's kind of cute, which helps. But she's a math major, but she had to overcome a, a great fear, yeah. especially of her ability, which seemed to be lacking compared to others in her classes. And she talks about how she handled that. Right. I, you, you could you, could you send a, a, a link to me, and then I'll post it somewhere that's useful? Thank you. Um, I really appreciated what you said about the, the caring thing. There, there's so many things that we instinctively do as instructors. You know, we, we establish rapport, we cut, crack jokes with our students, you know, all of those little things we do to in increase uh, a sense of engagement. That is getting right at this category. Because, for example, if I crack a joke with all of you right now, you're in on the joke. Everybody else who's out of the room is not in on a joke, and therefore, by definition, you belong to the insiders who know this joke, right? So it's a small thing, but these little things add up, and they make students feel like they actually belong in your class. Okay? Now, <clears throat> esteem, I'm going to move on to that one. Um, I'm going to map that onto self-concept. That's a, a maybe a, a kind of a loaded educationese word, but I think of it um, simply as sort of like self confidence but targeted to a, a specific domain so self-confidence is more like a generalized feeling or a characteristic a personality trait that you may or may not have right but <coughs> self-concept is more targeted because it's your assessment of your own competence or ability to succeed in any given domain so I may or may not be a self-confident person overall, but when it comes to playing the basketball, playing, playing basketball, I already showed you I'm really horrible at playing basketball. I have a very low self-concept of myself as a basketball player, but I may have a high self-concept of myself as a learner of mathematics, right? So here, insert your own discipline. What is the self-concept that your students have about themselves? And they want to build up their own self-concepts. They don't want to think of themselves as incompetent. They want to be competent, okay? And then the last one here, self-actualization, that's not supposed to be like new age -y weird. Um, what is meant by that is um, self-actualization happens when you fulfill the desire to accomplish everything that you can be and that you want to be. Isn't that awesome? I would love that for all of our students, okay? Now, part of Maslow's original theory was that there are four things that are so-called basic, and then there's one that's called growth at the top. The reason that he did that is because he theorized that these four, if you don't have them, cause you to be anxious and to be really urgent to meet that need. Whereas he, he theorized that it wasn't quite that way for the, the top one. And I just point that out here as a reminder because if students do not feel safe, from ridicule in your class or fa safe to talk out or ask a question, they're going to feel anxious and that anxiety will inhibit their learning and their ability to participate or willingness to participate in any activity that you want them to do. Okay? So can we top, tuck this in as number one, concept number one, and then I'm going to do number two. All right. Number two, <coughs> status. Um, definition. Status is a student's perception of her, his academic capability and social standing relative to others in the group. Okay? This is a huge, huge issue. Students expect themselves and they expect others to be competent or not as competent to each other. It happens all the time. Whether you want it or not, it will happen. Okay? These differences in expectations greatly affect the degree to which people participate in a group activity. Um, the issue, obviously, is that within a group of students, if you have students with different levels of status, the one that has the low status is going to probably be the one that you're most concerned about. 
How do you identify students that have low status? <clears throat> so these are some common symptoms. A low status student may not be talking very much. They may appear disinterested. They may even be disruptive. Um, they may be physically separated from the others. They may have body language that indicates a closed position, like maybe folded arms or just like looking down, that kind of thing. Those are signs that sometimes indicate a student has low status. So when you were doing a group activity just now, I was watching you very carefully <laughs> to see if there were people with low status, and I didn't see any. Um, I also noticed, though, that a lot of you, actually every single one of you, had only one person do the writing on the board. And that's usually one of the things I look at, like who's in control of the thing that you need to do the task? Is one person hogging that thing? If it is the case, then it could be that that person thinks he or she has high status and that other people have low status as a result because they're not accessing the task that is at hand. Okay? Um, <clears throat> the problem with low status is that you often can't distinguish between who isn't interested in the task and who has low status. And you might assume incorrectly that somebody is not interested when they actually are really interested, but they feel like they can't participate because others think that they're incompetent at the task. And it's a vicious circle because if you feel like you are low status, then you're probably not going to participate. And as a result, not participating, other people think that you're not competent because you're not participating. And then they assign you low status, and the teacher assigns you low status, and then it just becomes worse and worse and worse. Okay? So status is a really is a large issue. And I think the, the largest issue, and the one that for me is, is I'm, I'm really working on, is the following thing. Um, status often correlates really strongly with student characteristics like race, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic background, um, even a level of attractiveness. Because in our society, we value people who are good looking. We value people who are extroverts. I'm always reminded yesterday by Sarah's talk. So these are things that we say as a society we like. And so if you're not one of those things, sort of automatically, even unconsciously, you're marked down for not being one of those things. And what happens is if you are not careful, and this has happened to me many times, if you are not careful to address stereotypes in your class, when you form groups, you run the risk of replicating inequalities and bias that exist in society in little microcosms of inequity all over the room. So a little group of biased people over here, a little group of biased people over here. And the truth is, we're all biased. We all have prejudices. But we can't let those affect the way that we work with each other and we, um, we learn from each other. So uh, I don't want to belabor the point. I just want to say that this is a really important issue that we have to be cognizant of in our classes. Um, probably the experience that we can all jump to the easiest is maybe the experience where you have four men and one woman in a group. If you just talk that set of five people together, chances are, if they don't already know each other pretty well, the four men are going to assume the woman is not as competent as the four men. The four men are going to discount whatever she says. And whatever she says is going to be ignored. And she's probably not going to participate. And you may think that she is low, um, not interested or low skilled. But she actually may be very, very skilled. But she's just been assigned low status in the group. So what are some uh, strategies for addressing status problems within groups? So let me share some of these things with you. <coughs> OK. I'll start with some really uh, cheesy basic ones. Um, I was debating during the activity whether to yell at you, but I couldn't get your attention, I think. But oftentimes what I do is I'll say, um, switch, which means whoever's got the pen has got to pass it off to somebody else. And they have to stop taking charge. This happens a lot when I use computers, too. If I have two people share a computer, the person who's doing the computing often is like taking over, and the other person is like, what am I here for? So usually what happens if two people are sharing a computer, um, 
the person who's typing can only type what the other person says to type. And then after a few minutes, I'll yell switch, and they have to switch. So I'm not always good about that, but I really want to be in the practice of doing that because I want more equitable interactions between my students. Um, so sometimes the scarcity of the resource can actually work in your favor because it requires people to work together to share that thing. Okay? Um, norms are a huge thing. What are the norms of behavior and respectable talk in your class? Have you established those? Um, how do you monitor them? And how do you change problematic behavior that you observe during group work? I tend to be a little bit shy of confrontation personally, so I, I don't like calling people out like, hey, don't say blah, 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 blah. What I usually do instead is if I notice some like funky behavior is happening over here or if I'm not sure, I'll just walk over here close to you and you guys might be doing something really awesome that I want you guys to do. And I'll say, wow, I love the way that you guys have shared that thing and you're really going back and forth and you're, you're debating that issue in a way that's really critical and but still friendly and supportive. You know, I might say that kind of loudly so you'll hear and then maybe that might trigger to you that you have to do that same thing too as opposed to like telling you, no, 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 you didn't do this thing. Okay, So that's one of my tricks. It's also a trick that I use that if I want to monitor group work and I want to hear what you're saying, I usually don't like do this because as soon as you do that, people will just like like look at you and think that you're supposed to interact with them. So I'll look and I'll stand over here and I'm, I look as if I'm paying attention to you, but I'm actually listening to you over here, which is um, much more effective if you want to get a real sense of what the students are saying to each other. Okay, uh, what else about status? Let me see. Oops, did I scoot back? Oh, this is the problem with this app. Okay, um, okay here comes the hard ones. <clears throat> Convince students that there are multiple ways of being successful in your class. That there's not just this one way of like being the fastest, the first one to get the answer. Um, especially in mathematics, it's really hard. So, um, for example, I might call someone out for saying, I really love the way that you made that connection between that geometric idea and this algebraic expression. That was amazing. So that's a different way of being successful than being the first one to calculate the answer. If you can convince students that there are multiple ways of being successful and that not everyone is always successful in every one of those things, then there's a chance that I might value you for being successful in a slightly different axis than me. I might be really good on this axis, you are really good in that axis, but together we can work together on this task. Okay? Um, and then, Finally, the, the one that's the most hard for me to do is um, assigning competence. So if you have a really, really tricky low status issue in your class where the kids are clearly ignoring one person and the person is frustrated, it doesn't always work well. But what can be really effective is if you kind of walk up to the group and you say, oh, wow, I really, I noticed that you did this here. That was really wonderful. I wonder if you've shared that with the rest of the group. Or you say it loud enough to, you, you know, oh, did you guys notice that Rachel has done this really amazing thing? She might, you might want to ask her about that, you know. The, the trick about that one is it has to be authentic. It can't be fake. It can't be like, oh, Rachel, your sweater is so nice today. Like, that does not work. <laughs> In fact, it's, it's fake and it will counter, it will, it will reverse back on you, okay? So it has to be authentic, but if you assign someone competence in your group because the teacher is doing it, then the students are like, oh, well, if the teacher noticed something, maybe that really is something to it, okay? But that is a potentially powerful way to solve a status problem in a group. Okay, let me pause and see if you guys are still okay. Yeah. Question, you mentioned earlier going between disinterest versus low status. Can you address the third issue of when someone actually is low skill, like they really don't mm. have the background and they just don't have anything there because they don't know how to do it? Yeah, okay, yeah. Can I, can I put that one on pause for one second? And anything else? Mm -hmm. Then that 
yeah, yeah. Maybe let's can we park that for a second? So maybe di um, differences in 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 motivation and grades. How much grades care? I think it has to do a lot with in extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation differences between people. Okay. Um, you guys all still with me? I'm so sorry I'm talking so much. All right, third big idea, and I think this might address a little bit of Jennifer's question, group-worthy task. Okay, so not every single activity or task that you want to give students is worthy of being done in a group. That's pretty much, yeah, that's it. Okay. And you have to be really mindful of using suitable tasks when you want to do authentic group work. So um, I'm going to put up five characteristics of group-worthy tasks, at least defined by Rachel Lotan in her great paper. Here are the five characteristics of tasks that are really worthy of doing in a group. They are open-ended and require complex problem solving. Now this is the one that They have multiple entry points and ways to show competence. That's the hard one. <coughs> They involve intellectually important content. They require positive group interdependence and also individual accountability. And five, there's clear criteria for the evaluation of the group product. Okay, I'll just let you absorb that for a second. I find this really powerful and also daunting because I recognize all of the previous activities that I had done that perhaps weren't very group worthy. The problem with using tasks that aren't super group worthy is that they can feed into the two previous issues that I talked about, the status and the, all of the belongingness and the self-concept, all of those issues. Because if I give you a task like you know, okay, let's, let's calculate the multiplication table. I don't need to do that together with you. You and I can independently do that. And if I can do it by myself and you can do it by yourself, then what happens is we both do it and one of us will do it first. And the one who does it first is gonna be like, I did it first, I feel great. The person who did it second is gonna feel, I'm not as good as the first person. So that just reinforces all of those issues as before. Okay? Now there are ways to trick up that kind of activity to make it a little bit more groupy. Like some, stu some, some people like to assign group roles when you, when you make a group of students. Like some people do like a group of four. One student is the reporter, recorder. One student is the timekeeper. One person is the facilitator. One person is the resource manager or whatever. There's a billion different kinds of little arrangements that you can do. That doesn't actually change the task at hand. It's just a little structure you plop on top to try to make the students work together a little bit more. And those are totally fine. And I'm not saying that you can't ever do group unworthy tasks in a group. I'm just saying that you run the risk of making the interaction not as great for students or not having some of the things that you wanted to accomplish be accomplished. Like if you really want to do some of these very ambitious things, then you might want to use group work because you can only attack really ambitious problems if you have a bunch of people together with the brain power to collectively work on that thing. Now in math, this is the one that's really hard for me because coming up with a problem that a student who maybe can't take a derivative yet can do, and maybe someone else who's really good at taking derivatives can do at the same time, that could be really challenging. So either the task can't only involve taking a derivative, or that might be just one piece, or maybe I allow them to use Wolfram Alpha, you know, suck it up. Okay, everyone's going to use this calculator at some point, so maybe that's fine. So there, there are different issues to consider, but being able to honestly to yourself say that different people at different skill levels could still get into the problem, that's really important. The second one right there. Okay. 
um, I'm going to pause here and see if people want to raise any issues. Because I'm done with that key concept part, I'm going to move on to the um, like practical matters section. Yeah, please. So, do I understand this correctly that all five should be satisfied for group worthy tasks, or is it? According to Rachel, but maybe not. Maybe not every one of them is equally important to you. So I'm thinking of the thing that you had us do. Mm -hmm. If I look at these five things, well, okay, open ended, complex problem solving, not mm -hmm. so much. Not uh, so much. Yeah. You know, intellectually important content, I guess so. Uh, interdependence, individual accountability. So right. I think this was a very useful thing. Mm -hmm. People talked about and, and, and brought out various things when they're walking around. I thought it was very interesting. I thought, oh, this is a good way to have share out sort of the group content, but this doesn't quite fit this lofty goal. Right. So, right. I mean, it seems to me that there are very few that would, you know, satisfy. All yes. five. No, you're right. Exactly right. And so maybe this gets back to the purposes question. So, what's really f awkward and funny whenever we talk about teaching is like, you know, when we talk about teaching, we're teaching. And so like there's this <laughs> meta thing that's happening. So you might also ask me like, what was the purpose behind you doing that activity? Okay. So my main purpose was I wanted people to get to know each other. And I wanted you all to see that it was a huge amount of commonality between your purposes for group work. And so for me, it didn't matter too much whether people would have positive interdependence with each other because I was assuming that all of you being adults and teachers would generally be okay with that. So I wasn't super concerned with that. And I also knew that I could walk around and, and take care of individual issues if I really needed to. Um, I also wasn't worried about some people finishing like way sooner than other people because I also just said you could fill in as many as you wanted. So that was a, an arbitrary sort of time limit. And I cut you off at a, at a specific time. Um, and I, I disagree. Yeah, oh, sure. All okay, I please mean, go ahead. Like the interdependence that mm. calls in my group, there, mm. one person would kind of stutter and try and formulate an idea, but had something in their mind. A second person would refine it by maybe changing the vocabulary, and a third person would change the order and, and the terms. I mean, we all interdependent, mm. Uh, mm. interdependent on each other mm. to, to, to write the final phrase on the board. It wasn't just one person saying this and it get wrote down. Second person said something and it got wrote down. Mm. Mm. Three of us refined and changed everything we wrote. Mm. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to chalk it up to your guys being exceptionally awesome though, you know, cuz it could be, it could easily be like, you know, you can imagine right in your class, well, what did you write down? A, B, C, okay, A, B, C. What did you write down? Okay, D, E, F. What did you write down? Okay, there's our list. <laughs> right, it could happen that way too, and nothing in what I said really could counteract that. There had to be some other thing. Maybe you had to build in. By the way, on that note, um, Fred, I'll just flash this. I wasn't going to do it, but I'll just maybe I'll do it really quickly. Um, uh, this concept of exploratory talk, when you uh, notice groups of students talking with each other, they say all kinds of things. It could be that they're off task, like, oh my gosh, did you see that movie last week? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So there's that. But assuming they're on task and actually talking about the work, there's still different kinds of talk that they can have. There can be the uncritical kind, where you basically like, oh, OK, yeah, sure. Uh-huh, yeah, that's good, yeah. You know, like where you're just going along. You're don't, not really sure if you care or not. But then there's the kind of talk that Fred was just discussing. This like kind of fits and starts. Like, wait, wait, I'm, I mean that, oh, no, like can you clarify? You know, I'm not finishing my sentences because you're kind of helping me and we're refining. And there's this notion that the conversation is actually shared by all three people in the group at that same time. And that you're all thinking it out loud at the same time. That kind of talk is the most powerful kind of talk. And you want to have that kind of talk in group work. Okay? And I some people have called. You could do group work in a large lecture room. Mm. If you take three people sitting in adjacent seats, that's, the, I think, the ideal size. One person in the middle, one on each side. And ah, you can have that yeah. kind of exploratory talk in a large lecture hall mm -hmm. with three people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
we did it, right? It's true. Downstairs, I think we did it pretty well. We I think, yeah. Filled. Right. Yeah. One, one thing is for our students, I think it, it might have to be that we might have to be a little explicit about that. Like, this is the kind of talk I value. And I might need to even model it for you just to show you what I want to hear because students don't really know. If I said, oh, I want you to have exploratory talk, they'll be like, well, I don't know what that is. Okay. But it turns out that th there have been researchers who have sort of done textual analyses and recordings of students working together. And the correlation between exploratory talk and group performance and success is really high. Okay, so our time is rapidly drawing to a close, and there's like so many things I want to ask you, and I'm sure you have a million questions too. Okay, so I'm going to throw up some questions on the board, issues, and maybe we can just start talking more practical things. So a huge practical issue. How do you form your groups? Okay, so there are all kinds of issues here. Uh, how many people per group? Uh, What's the durability of the groups? By that I mean like how long do they last? Is it just for today or like are we staying in these groups for a whole week or a whole month? Like what's the protocol here? And then the big one is how do you compose the groups? Uh, do you let them select? Do you select? Do you randomly select? And if you select, how are you selecting? A very common thing people do is they, they group by ability. So either they group people that they think have the same skill level so all of my really high flyers are over here together. All of my ones who are struggling are all over here. Or are you heterogeneously grouping high, low? By the way, I really don't like using that word, but I'm using it as a shortcut because I hate like, marking a student as being high or low. But I think you know what I mean when I say that. Someone who's really struggling maybe or is like, lacking in a basic skill. Okay. So meh. I'm going to uh, maybe just point out that group size and durability are usually more practical issues that are constrained by the class format or whatever. Like here, there were 27 people, and there were a limited number of spaces on the board. So that's why I came up with three. It wasn't a magic thing. That's all it was. Um, durability, how long do you have in class? What's the length of the assignment? You know, so that's sort of maybe another issue. But the durability could come into another issue where maybe you want to switch it up regularly because I think someone said this morning they want their students to get to know each other, so they're constantly rearranging the group. So that could be your purpose, for there to be connections formed to build belongingness, and then for those group interactions to then spill out outside of class so they'll actually work with each other. So maybe you want to do that. Okay? This part down here, though, is incredibly complicated. And I can say, after many hours of reading literature, I'm still super confused by that. Um, I will share with you two quotes from different research articles that I've, I've um, I think, kind of captured different things. Yeah, you'll see. OK, well, just I'll read it to you. Here we go. Uh, Lou et al. analyzed 20 independent findings from 12 studies that directly compared homogeneous ability grouping with heterogeneous grouping. They find a slight superiority of homogeneous grouping, but the superiority was not uniform across study findings. Low ability students perform best in heterogeneous groups. Medium students perform best in homogeneous groups. And high ability students perform equally well in either type of group. OK. Well, I mean, but you do hear this a lot uh, among when you talk to colleagues. Like, oh, I group them with a low, medium, and high because I know that the low one is going to get a lot out of it from the experience. So you hear people say that. And maybe there's some evidence for that here. This one happens to be a meta-analysis of 20 different studies. So that kind of means like, OK, maybe I trust this a little bit more. But it turns out that the variability, even within those 20 studies, was pretty big. Some of them were like no effect whatsoever, and then some were moderately large effects, not huge effects, like a little bit of an effect. Okay, so that's just one take. Here's another one uh, visibly random grouping. So let me say what I mean by uh, what this person means by visibly. Okay, so this person is advocating for random groups in a way where the formation of the group is visibly random to everyone in the room, as opposed to me just walking into the room with a list and be like, oh, I randomly made this list. Here you go. You're one, two, three, and you're four, five, six. You know, Students are very skeptical because they'll be like, mm, did you really do that random? Or did you force me to be with this person I really don't like? So that's why the count off is a cheap way to do the visibly random thing, or a dice, or a card or whatever. There are lots of ways to mix it up in the moment so that you show everyone it really is random. Okay. Um, okay. So this is what this person said. 
Oops, no, not that one. Although we met with some resistance in the beginning, within three to four weeks, the visibly random approach led to these things. Students become agreeable to work in any group they're placed in. There is an elimination of social barriers within the classroom. Mobility of knowledge between students increases. Reliance on the transfer, uh, reliance on teacher for answers decreases. Reliance on co-constructed intra and intergroup answers increases. Engagement increase. Students become more enthusiastic. I don't know, that seemed kind of cool to me. Um, only catch, 10th graders, math class, it was in Canada. I'm not bagging on Canadians. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, it's a very specific context, right? So, and it's just one class observed over a few months. So, I don't know, maybe I, I kind of desperately want to believe that that may be good. Um, but I think we just don't know. We really, really don't know. And I think part of the reason we don't know is because students carry along with them so many other things, those variables like what they ate last night and how much sleep they got and how they feel about themselves that particular day. So it's just so hard to know. It really is so hard to know. Yeah. Well, I can see how having these people switched around to different groups does feed into some of these. I mean, you, you have to deal with different people. You're not stuck with some group if you don't like the group. And it gives the perception of, you know, I'm not being labeled or, you know, put in a certain grouping thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I can see how that has some of these effects. Mm -hmm. If it's not just the right. Country. Right. Another side thing I just mentioned is that I think when we are purposeful in our group work, that's great. But as um, Rick Olson reminded us, it's also important to share those purposes with the students. So if you are doing this for a specific reason, then say it. I purposely put you in random groupings because it's really important you learn how to work with other people in industry. That's like one of the number one things uh, employers tell us. And so I'm forcing you to work with someone you may or may not know because that's an important life skill to have. Maybe that in and of itself will convince people to go along with it. But you have to be explicit about that goal, and then you map it onto a decision or a parameter that you decided on for your group work. OK, so I'm not raising any issues. Do you, does anyone want to share any more um, experience or uh, sage advice about how you form groups? I do a little bit of that. Um, sometimes in one of my classes, it depends on the kind of class. Um, I have students on the very first day, they fill out a little survey, tell me like what they want out of the class. And then the last question at the bottom says, draw a picture of what it looks like in your head when you are doing math in classroom. And so it kind of lets me know what they think. Often it's people working by themselves, not in a group. Often it's like doing rote tasks. Often you've, they're like sad faces and really frustrated faces, question marks, like, you know, that lets me know a lot. But I, I didn't quantify that in any way. I don't do other people do similar things? I just had a follow-up question. To you. Would you suggest or consider forming groups based on those perceptions that you got? either homogenous or heterogeneous, you could go either way there too, yeah. but like a perception grouping rather than ability? I'm going to toss it out there because I'm considering right now for the first time. <laughs> yeah. Can you repeat the question? Oh, mm -hmm. my, go ahead. oh, sorry. My question was if students share this information with you at the beginning of the semester, their perception of how they feel about group work, if then you might consider forming your groups based on those perceptions, sort of like ability grouping, but based on how they said they felt about it. I was just wondering if anyone had done that. Or so I'm going to say, so I, I believe that Jennifer, Mott, um, she doesn't have Jennifer on the last name, but I'm going to mess it up. Jennifer Mott, who's giving the team-based learning workshop, I believe she does something like that. Oh, cool. So I might fly her down um, and ask her about cool. that. Thank you. Sorry, I can't answer. I have not. Somebody 
<laughs> yeah. My only thought right off the top of my head is I would probably not want to put f three people who hate group work with one person who loves it because then that one person would probably take over and be like, Mrr. that's my only thought. Yeah, Stephanie. be both yeah no both of those things yeah and actually that was the, the last one I was gonna just throw up here how do you guys assess group work is there individual accountability and group accountability or both or some combo what's the weighting to each um, does some part of the grade or assessment depend on the group functioning well you know sometimes people do that where it's like rate how well your team did and that's worth like five percent or something like that right do you do that Go ahead. I, I do group work in class, but I've never done projects and assess grades. But I did read about a rubric years ago mm. that I, if I ever do group projects, long term group projects with a grade, I would use this rubric. And it was the, the professor assigns a grade to the project, mm -hmm. and then the group members rate a close some percentage of contribution of effort. Mm. For example, if there's four people in the group, they should each contribute 25 percent of, of the work of the project but when they rate each other and you just do an average you know of all their ratings mm -hmm. if someone contributed 15 percent and someone else contributed 40 percent then based on how low the 25 from 25 percent to 15 percent was that individual would receive a lower grade for wow. his grade right the person who contributed more than their share would receive a slightly higher grade mm -hmm. so then for Great. If the project was a B project, the first person might get a B minus or a C. The second person might get a B plus or an A. Interesting. So I've always thought I'd do that, but I haven't. Anyone yeah. else? Yeah. I yeah. Do There's that. lots. Yeah. I do that. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead in the back. It works. In my experience, except in like kind of the disaster cases, they tend to just always put 25, 25, 25. <laughs> yeah. But it's in, in, in disaster cases, they do. They do they say. The percentage they assign is secret and anonymous. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, in my case, it's not secret because you have to know. So I have rated, and I told them, you know, it's okay if not everybody contributes 25% to each task, like the writing. Because in groups, you know, when you have a team and you say you're really good at writing, that person's going to do the writing. But overall, and rate it, and you will get the student who's the slacker will indicate that they did less. So they may say uh -huh. I did fifteen percent of the group. The others might say that person only did ten percent. But I've seen it where you know a lot do the twenty-five percent. But if there's really an, an equity, the person who didn't do as much work will indicate that they did less work. And I found you know the first time I did that, I thought yeah you know no slacker is going to write down they did less work, but they actually did. Mm. So it was consistent. Cool. The percentages might. Change, but you know the person, and, and I do adjust. You know, it's like if there is a big in different, a uh, big unevenness, you know, maybe adjust it up or down. Cool. There's a research tool I can't remember the university at Cappy.org, and it's a peer evaluation tool. It'll also set up teams for you. I've never used that part. Oh, cool. But there's you can take the questions, and they're all validated, and. Um, um, so you can say, I want my students to be five, and, and, and choose to share the results of that with the teams or not, like if you're on projects for milestones and stuff. And if you share them, they're anonymous, but they see what they got from the rest of the team. And there are things like contributes or communicates clearly, or there's different. Yeah. And I found that to be really useful. And it also has a part that says, here's what the team gave Bob, and here's how Bob saw himself. They evaluate themselves too, so they can see that Bob thinks he's doing a great job, but his team doesn't see that. So that's kind of handy. Is that a C-A-P? Yeah, like a cap. Cat. Oh, cat. Cat. Cat me. C a t m e dot org. Org. Okay. And it's free. Cool. Thank you. I've helped 
for running over. Um, I'll leave you with one final thought, and that is that if you care about group work, then like everything else about your teaching, you should probably measure it somehow. If you don't know whether students are enjoying it or having a good time, then you can't improve. So you might want to make some questions for yourself, even for your assessment, and of course evaluation about group work just specifically so that you know whether you're doing well. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. How awesome you guys were.